Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand together. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. We're gonna be taking communion, so if you haven't grabbed those elements, they're in the back. But before we get started, let's all just worship the Lord together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I've been my faith. Let me down He's faithful through generations 
Lord, all of those things we're so thankful for, the, the hope, the joy, the life that we have for eternity with you because of the cross. Lord, how thankful we are. I pray your blessing on this time, Lord, that worship would continue as we open our Bibles now and study the scriptures. May it just bring us to a better understanding of the power of the cross, how the salvation that you've provided for us is so perfect. So bless this time, sharpen our minds that we'd receive your word well, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Wednesday night, we continue through the Bible. Would you turn with me to Luke 23? That'll be where we'll be studying Wednesday night. But we draw our text on these Sunday mornings from our upcoming Wednesday study through the Bible. We don't skip a verse, chapter, or book. We go right through. So Luke chapter 23, um, we have the story of the cross. Um, this is, a, you know, the holy of holies of, of the Bible, maybe, if you think about it. Um, you know, where Jesus, God becomes a man, dies on the cross. And I just want to read through Luke's account of the cross. Man, you can't, it, it, you can't uh, do better than that, reading what Jesus did for us. So let's take a look here, uh, Luke chapter 23, and we'll begin here in verse 26. Luke 23, 26. It says in verse 26, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and women which also bewailed and lamented him. And Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they, there they crucified him with the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And people, the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked, uh, mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, do not thou fear God seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. Luke's account of the cross is a little more on the brief side. Um, it just kind of gives us some general things that some of the things we don't know from previous gospels. But when you put all four gospels together, you, you just see what an important moment this really is. The, 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 the fact that God becomes a man, lives on, on the earth, 
a perfect life, and then he's crucified. Uh, one of the darkest moments in the world's history when we see sinful, depraved humanity slaughtering the perfect man who lived on this earth and did nothing to deserve it. The cross was an instrument of torture. It's amazing, you know, the cross is such a symbol, you know, that people wear on their necks or put on their churches. And I worry that they don't even know what it means. It's like when you go to Jerusalem, you see crosses. These are some iPhone pictures I took over the years. Um, the pillar on the left there is uh, the pillar as you walk into the church that's in the middle there. But when you walk in, there's a pillar, you know, it's, you know, it's a really, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's super old, old church. But you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have been carving little crosses in this pillar as you walk into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the traditional view is of where Jesus died and was buried. Uh, they built that in Jerusalem. And just the crosses, you know, um, by the way, I've taken a picture of that pillar every time I go to Jerusalem. So I've got like, you know, all these pictures of the, and you see once in a while a new cross chiseled in. Uh, last time I had some bubble gum on there that they, somebody stuck on there. But, um, you know, uh, the problem is, uh, do we really even know what the cross means? See, in Jerusalem, it means this is a Christian place. That's what it means. But the word Christian even is sort of dubious nowadays. What is a real Christian and what does it mean? When you go to Jerusalem, there's a lot of weird definitions of what people call Christianity. But I, I'm concerned that the cross has lost some of its uh, you know, meaning because, well, it's become more of a symbol, um, which the biblical message of the cross is about salvation, not about symbolism. Uh, we have to be really careful with the cross, I think, as an image that we set up and we place uh, and it's okay, I'm not knocking if you're wearing a necklace or if a church wants to put a cross on their building, that's great. Um, uh, well, bro, that's the problem. Why does an AC Creek have a cross on their building? Because everybody tells us we have to have one. That's why we don't have one. Um, in fact, I'm gonna show you maybe a little reason why you should be really careful with that. And you know, I, I love it. If a church has a cross on their building, that's great. You know, the, across the freeway, the church took care of it for us. We got big ones right across there, uh, big crosses, that's great. Um, but one of the things we have to be really careful is, is not forgetting that it's not about the symbolism, it's about the power behind the cross. In fact, Paul put it this way, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the preaching of the cross uh, uh, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That last phrase there, that's what the cross is. The cross is the power of God, the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, let me remind you, there's absolutely no requirement in the whole of scripture for making an image of the cross and putting it on your church building or wearing it around your neck. There's no mandate for that. Um, but there's an undeniable and very clear mandate for the preaching of the cross, the truth of the cross. That is mandated. So if you're worried about a church building that doesn't have a cross, um, don't worry about that. Where are they preaching the cross of Jesus Christ? You know what I've found? I'm not trying to be insulting, but I've noticed sometimes the churches with the biggest crosses on their building, they talk about it the least of all churches in the sermons. Uh, it's all about the cross. And when I talk about the cross, you have to understand you gotta talk about hell and death and wrath and judgment because that's what the cross saves you from. So if you're not preaching about the truth of God's wrath and judgment and hell, you're not really preaching what the cross is about. You gotta understand the black backdrop of sin and depravity to see the beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of an important thing. And that's why Paul the apostle, you know, the older he got, he said stuff like this, you know, of course in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, he said, but we preach Christ crucified. He didn't say we preach five ways to have a happy family, four ways to balance your checkbook. You know, how to be a more community organizer or how to, you know, bark dust your elementary schools. And like, we forget what we're supposed to be preaching. But it's really, Paul said, I have determined to know nothing, not to know anything except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. The word crucifixion or crucified is death on a cross. And that's what the Bible, you know, tells us that the mandate, it's not to put a cross on your building, it's to preach the cross, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that raises a question, why is the cross so necessary? There's churches that really avoid the topic altogether and talk about the victorious you, awakening the giant within. Like it's all about you and self and improvement, self improvement, it's like motivational speakers talking in churches. Uh, it's like a TED talk instead of a Bible teaching about the cross of Jesus. 
Why do they, why do people want to get away from the cross? It's even like when Oprah Winfrey said, I don't really believe Jesus is the only way. You know, she believes there's many paths that lead to sort of whatever nirvana or salvation is that she believes today. The cross is not necessary. She would say it is a way. And I just have to say, if there were other ways to be saved and God says, I'm going to provide a way and it involves killing my son for that way, is that a good thing that God would kill his son if there are many other ways to heaven? The logic lacks pretty painfully. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father which is heaven, but by me. The singularity of salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ is biblically um, nailed down, airtight, perfectly unmovable. Uh, yeah, I, hope, I hope you understand that. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, so why is the cross even necessary? And I, I wanna go over two points today. Point number one, uh, the cross was necessary to satisfy God, to satisfy God. Um, it was the Lord Jesus who would use these words when talking to Nick at night. Jesus talked to Nick at night? Yeah, Nicodemus. Uh, Jesus saw Nicodemus and Nicodemus kind of snuck in at nighttime to talk at Jesus. And they had a very interesting conversation. You know, Jesus said stuff like, you must be born again. He's like, what? Climb in your mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus said, oh, hey, are you a teacher in Israel? You don't even know the answer to this? And Nick's like, I don't know what they're talking about. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Um, you were born in sin and death um, and you need to be saved and have new life. And that's what born again is. But in that same conversation, Jesus said in John 3, 14, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Does anybody know what the next verse says after that? John three sixteen. Everybody knows that, right? Like even if you watch an NFL game, you'll see it out there. John three sixteen, And it's, you know, it's, it's similar, but before you can have John three sixteen, you have to have John three fourteen and 15. Brett, that's dumb saying, oh, we understand 14 and 15 come before 16. No, but my point is, before you can have God loving the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What a glorious truth that is. But before you have that, how does it work? Is it just, just by chance that John 3.16 is true? No. The reason John 3.16 is true is because you got John 3.14, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, and the key word there I want you to see is, even so must must, not possibly, or could, or would, or should. Even so, must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up. That, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What's this whole Moses lifting up a serpent in the wilderness thing? And what does that have to do with anything? Well, Jesus is reaching back into the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament is a picture book. I love it. I love all the Old Testament stories. These churches say, we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Oh, what a poor, sorry exchange to not have the whole Bible just, just for the New Testament alone. Because the Old Testament pictures everything New Testament. And this is one of those beautiful ones. Jesus reaches back to Moses in Numbers chapter 21. Let's take a look. In fact, would you keep your finger in Luke 23 and flip over to Numbers chapter 21 with me. That's toward the beginning of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Um, Numbers chapter 21. And I want you to be kind of familiar with this story because it ties in so perfectly. If you want to understand the cross of Jesus Christ, I think you have to understand the story of Numbers 21 because it's, it's Jesus compares it. Um, you might say, you know, even as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Some people say, you mean like lifting up the name of Jesus? Nope. Lifting up Jesus onto a pole and crucifying him. That's what it's referring to. Let's take a look. Numbers 21, right there in verse four. It says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, saying, wherefore have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. 
Now pause there for a second. What are these? These are the same people God opened up the Red Sea, delivered them from the Egyptians, has provided manna, bread, and water, and kept them alive all these years in a place of the wilderness that is just barren. I got a flat tire in this region once. Uh, I was driving th- uh, through this area of the Middle East in a taxi with a taxi driver named Rushdie, and we're, I was just thinking, man, I just would never want to be stuck out here. All of a sudden, boom, we got a tire blow, and we were uh, stuck out there for like three hours. Uh, but we finally got our tire fixed and drove on but I, I felt the heat and I, there's not even a weed on the ground. It's just dirt and rocks as far as the eye can see and it's hot. And no wonder these poor people were discouraged. They oh, we're sick of this. And they, but the, the problem is they got angry at God and they got angry at Moses. And then they started complaining about what God provided. He says, we, our soul loatheth. That's a nice King James way of saying hates. We hate this light bread. Are you somebody like, light bread? Is that like uh, sugar-free or gluten-free or like, no. The word light in the Hebrew is worthless in the Hebrew. It means worthless. We loathe this word. Have you ever called God's provision for you worthless? I hope you haven't. I hate this worthless job that I have. Could it be that God provided that job for you and you're complaining about it? Um, You know, the Bible says of manna, the bread that God was providing for them, it was called Uh, in the Psalms, uh, food from heaven, angel's food, angel food cake. It was angel food. That's what the Bible says. Manna was angel food. That's kind of interesting in Psalms. Um, uh, And and the Bible tells us, we don't even really know exactly what manna was, but it talks about a coriander seed, white sort of a, um, you know, substance that they could grind up. In fact, the Bible even says that the women would grind up the manna and make a sort of a meal out of it and make it, you know, make cakes or whatever out of manna crushings or whatever. So I'm sure they they perfected it. Over 40 years, you gotta be kind of creep. Maybe they made banana nut bread and, you know, manicotti and stuff like, I don't know what they made, but it was probably pretty good. But they were sick of it. We're sick of this light bread that we're eating. Now, be careful, murmuring and complaining. Let's see what happens to these people. It says here, it goes on in verse six. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, (laughs) duh. We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. I'm always amazed by Moses. I mean, he, he doesn't always behave perfectly, but if it was me and the people either yelling at me saying, Brett, you brought us out here to die and we hate God, we hate you. Then I'd say, oh, I'll pray for the serpents to go away. Maybe tomorrow, we'll, we'll see how I feel tomorrow. Uh, good luck running from them little snakes. <laughs> like Moses, he just goes right to the Lord. Okay, Lord, he prays. And it says, verse eight, and the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of the brass, he lived. What an interesting story in the Old Testament. If you're just reading the Old Testament, like, what is that? That, What a weird story. You know, people being bitten by these little, the word fiery in the serpent means these little red snakes. Can you imagine how creative, that'd make a good movie, you know, horror movie. You're out in the desert and all of a sudden you're attacked by millions of fiery red snakes and people are dying. That's the story. You're like, what was that there for? Well, we know why it's there. It's because Jesus would use it, you know, centuries later and say, even as Moses made a brass serpent and put it up on a pole, even so must the son of man, myself, Jesus, he's saying, be lifted up and put on a pole so that you'll be saved. Just like they were bitten with the serpent venom and they'd look to the pole and live, the same thing Jesus said, true, you'll look to him and you'll live. We've been bitten by sin. We've all been bitten by sin. Just like they sinned against the Lord, because of that, there's wrath and judgment. See, if you don't realize that God is a righteous God and demands righteousness and justice and judgment, um, but you have to understand we're doomed. We're just like the, the story in the, in the numbers here is we're just like that, where um, there's, there's a righteous God who needs satisfaction. He doesn't just wink at sin. There's judgment for sin. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting because 
Uh, for me, um, I remember in college, I went to Southern Oregon University, not exactly a Christian institution, if you know what I mean. It was kind of very much like a little miniature berserkly, I mean Berkeley. Um, and uh, it was very, very crazy. But I, I remember, you know, I had all kinds of professors saying all kinds of things, but I remember one professor made the case for like two whole class sessions. Christianity is just like all the other pagan religions. You know, it's the idea of, you know, the gods need to be appeased. And if you appease the gods with human sacrifice, then the gods will be appeased for that. And he just said, Christianity is just like all the rest. That's what, that's what his whole argument was. Um, I, I remember being able to kind of correct him after his bloviating uh, as just a, you know, 18 year old kid, I did my best, but I just remember there's a huge difference. Um, you know, if you study human sacrifice throughout the ages, it's pretty horrifying. Some of the worst, if you know about this, the Celts practiced human sacrifice extensively. They did a thing where they built a giant wicker man, a wicker man out of this sort of wicker material. But it was like a big jail cell. And they had a, a little gate where they'd open it up and they'd put, they'd put slaves in there and pack this man full of slaves. Now, why would they put slaves in there? If a slave owner in the Celt culture in those days died, they would at once a year take all the slaves of all the slave owners who died that year and they'd put them in this wicker man, close them up and light the thing on fire and burn them all to death. Human sacrifice. They believed it sort of appeased the gods and it also allowed the slave uh, shockingly, after being burned, they would join their master in the afterlife to continue to serve their master. Not such a great deal for the slave on any account, if you ask me, getting burned so you go back and be a slave in eternity. Um, but that's, that's human sacrifice. Uh, you know, if you go to the South Pacific, uh, Captain Cook, and read some of the writings, you know, um, in the 1770s when he was there in Tahiti, uh, near Bora Bora and all that. If you've seen the beautiful pictures of that area, Captain Cook discovering that area with all the natives. Uh, this was a engraving that was made in the 1815 edition of Cook's Voyages. Uh, it was an artist rendering basically of uh, human sacrifice that they wanted to show how they did it to Captain Cook. And it's showing how they were killing their, their own people to appease the gods. Some of the worst cultures uh, were the Aztecs. The Aztecs did it, uh, you know, uh, daily. And the reason they do it daily is they felt that they had to, you know, appease the sun god. And to keep the sun moving in the sky, you had to keep sacrificing people. And they would cut people's hearts out and stuff like that. Um, maybe some of the most egregious of all human sacrifices in the Bible, uh, where this god Moloch, and these are artist renditions. And there's two kind of theories. In fact, there's ancient writings about how they sacrificed babies to Moloch. Um, one rendering of an ancient text talks about how they would heat up the arms of this iron god and then place the babies on the arms of the god and watch them sizzle. Uh, the depiction you'll see here in the bottom right-hand corner of that picture on the left is two guys banging away on the drums. That's, that's what they did. They would pound the drums because the screaming of the mothers and the screaming of the babies was so loud they had to drown it out with the drums beating and the chanting and what have you. It was a demonic, evil ritual. The, the, the artist rendering on the right there is from another ancient text that talks about how they would uh, kindle a giant hot fire in the backside of the back of the Moloch. And then in the front belly and chest, you have these little niches that were like cradle-sized situations where they would play several babies in the belly of Moloch, sacrificing them to their gods. I can't talk about that kind of human sacrifice with just saying, um, you say those people are horrible, but our culture is a million times more horrible. With abortion, we are doing worse than that. They killed tens of thousands of babies in Moloch in those days. We're killing millions and millions of babies. The place that should be the safest place for a baby is the mother's womb. But in our culture, it's the most hostile and and if you know how abortion works, it's, it makes this look like nothing. Um, if God judged the people for worshiping Moloch, he will judge people for uh, worshiping our pleasure and our sexual you know, revolution and just our freedom to do this or that. And we're doing it at the same way the Moloch people did. Uh, I think we need to repent for that. Humanity has, has been horrible in this one. Well, traditionally we believed in sacrifice but here's the difference. Why, what makes Christianity different than all the other human sacrifice things? Um, the big difference is this. Yes, God needed to be satisfied. God needed, if you would, I'm gonna even use the word appeasement. 
I'll show you how that comes into play here in a second. But God needs to be appeased. He is righteous and holy. And if he just winked at sin, if you, if you, um, you know, murder someone or rape someone or, you know, uh, you do, you know, rob a bank, God doesn't just wink at that, say, I'll just forgive you. There needs to be an appeasement, a satisfaction because he's righteous and he would not be righteous if he just said, oh, so you raped somebody, whatever, I forgive you, wink, nudge. That's not God. God is righteous and he de de you know, demands a satisfaction, an appeasement for that sin. But here's the difference. God didn't ask you to die in a Moloch or in a wicker man. God himself became a man and died for all of humanity. That's what makes it different than all the other wacko paganism that my college professor was saying, Christianity's the same. It's very much different. Our God didn't sit there and say, I need to be appeased, so kill a bunch of people. No, God, God actually says, a bunch of people have been horrible and sinful and they've caused death upon themselves. They've caused their own deaths. So I will sacrifice myself. Emmanuel, God becomes a man and dies on the cross for the sins of the world. He'd sacrifice himself to save humanity. So the cross, <coughs> excuse me, was God's plan all along. It's what the apostle Peter preached in Acts chapter two, verse 22. You men of Israel, Peter said to the Jews, that crucified Jesus. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. As you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now that's a big mouthful right there, but it's important. God preordained, he already knew what he was gonna do. Jesus would be the lamb of God slain when? Anybody know when was the Lamb of God slain? Yes, somebody said it, before the foundations of the world. What does that mean? That just means God had a plan. You know, the, like I said, the, the Bible starts with creation and then like 10 seconds later, humanity is sinful. The rest of the Bible is about God reconciling humanity back to himself, dealing with the unrighteousness of humanity and it's gotta somehow um, reconcile with his righteousness. How does God do that? It's by him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that it says you have taken and by the wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. This, this verse kind of speaks to me a bit of an ironic thing. God purposed that the very instrument used by humanity to reject Christ, the cross, the ugliness, the execution of a crucifixion, the very instrument that, that uh, used by man to reject Christ would be the very means by which righteousness and forgiveness would be obtained for sinful humanity. It's such an ironic thing. Humanity saying, crucify him, kill him. And meanwhile, God's saying, yep, and that's gonna be the very thing that will save humanity. What an ironic thing the cross is. Um, I'm so thankful that God had a plan and it's a pretty powerful plan. The cross was not only the will of God, but the reason why God purposed for Jesus to die. He went willingly. Hebrews 9, 28, for then must he often have suffered. Must, there's the word must again. Must he have offered suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's what differentiates Christianity from all the other human sacrifices to try to appease God. God is holy. That means he's absolutely pure and separate from sin. The nature of God sets his standard um, you know, for his justice. So he's unerringly, unchangingly, and uncompromisingly righteous. And because of that, there needs to be a dealing with sin. Now this starts to get into some of the nuances doctrinally. Um, man chose to sin. It happened way back in Genesis chapter two. You guys know the story. The Lord commanded uh, the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou shalt uh, eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was the... The, the, the sentence, death was the sentence pronounced and death was the sentence passed upon humanity when Adam and Eve uh, sinned. Uh, that's why Romans, Paul kind of jumps on that 
when he says in Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man, sin entered the world, that's Adam, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, uh, uh, upon all men so that uh, for all have sinned. Now, some of you say, Brett, that's unfair. I, why, why did Adam send us all to death? Um, if I were in the garden, I would have not eaten of the tree of the knowledge. Of the um, can I just say, you've already taken a big bite out of it. In fact, you did it. You were a sinner. Uh, the Bible says I was even, you know, we were born, born in sin. Like we have a sin nature that's just part of us that was inherited down through Adam. But Adam was sort of like the varsity team, Adam and Eve. You and I would be like JV trying to be in the garden of Eden. You have to understand that. Adam and Eve had it perfect. God's perfect plan, and yet they use their free will to just sin and bring death. So you have to understand, God's answer to man's plight of, of sin, death, and eternal hell, God's, God's answer would be that he could be the savior and the substitute. That's something I want you to understand is really important when you talk about the cross. He is our savior, but he's also our substitute. The word substitute is actually... Uh, um, a fancy doctoral word that I might say more accurately is propitiation. Uh, that's a good word. I'll show you what I mean. In Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5, we're told, but God, who is rich in mercy, which I'm so thankful. Aren't you glad God is rich in mercy? How long does God stay merciful? Yeah, his mercy endures forever. God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. He hath quickened or made alive again um, us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. Now, this is where I just start loving. You know, in Ephesians goes on in a couple of verses later, it's by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, as a gift from God, not of works, works, but lest any man should boast. Jesus did it all on the cross, and it's, it's his grace, undeserved, unfavored, undeserved, unearned favor that God shows to you and me. And that's how we're saved. Therefore, on the cross, the Lord Jesus himself was answering to God the Father for the sin of humanity, bearing in himself, in totality, the sin of God uh, of humanity. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, back to our little serpent story, the snake story there in Numbers. Jesus said, even as the serpent is lifted up, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. How could Jesus compare himself to a snake? Have you ever thought about that? Like, how could Jesus say, even like a snake, I'm gonna be lifted up? Jesus being perfect, anybody have an answer? How, how, why would Jesus compare himself to a serpent? It's this verse right here in 2 Corinthians. For he, God, made him, Jesus, to, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's why the serpent illustration is so fitting. The little fiery serpent that Moses made of brass. Um, by the way, remember I was talking about be careful with crosses and stuff like that, be, worshiping them and, and make, do you know what happened to that beautiful symbol that Moses made? Moses made a beautiful thing that saved Israelis from certain death. Um, centuries later, 500 years later, um, they kept it as a relic, you know, kind of like they kept the Ark of the Covenant and stuff like that. They kept Moses' bra brass serpent and pole um, and by the way, uh, that's where the symbol comes, like on your ambulance or uh, medical equipment. That's why there's a pole and a snake. It's because of the number story. Later, you might see two snakes going up one pole. That's from a later pagan version of the same thing, a sepalus, uh, it's a whole nother deal. But, but when you see the snake on the pole, that came from the Bible, the healing of God on people. But after about 500 years, the Jews started doing something really stupid. Um, and I, I say this carefully because we're dumber than they are. But they started worshiping the brass pole because it was Moses. 500 years earlier, Moses made the brass pole and the serpent, or the brass serpent and the pole. And so the people started worshiping. And you remember what King Hezekiah did? He threw it on the ground and beat it into pieces and said, Nehushtan. And they said, Gesundheit. <laughs> no, they didn't say that. I just made that up. Um, no, what, what is Nehushtan? Why did he say Nehushtan? Well, the, the word Nehushtan, it means it's just a thing of brass. It's just a thing. Stop worshiping it. So he ground it up and destroyed it. See, that's why I think, here's this beautiful Old Testament picture of the cross, the serpent and the pole, healing for humanity. 
And we've kind of done the same thing with the cross. I mean, if Taylor Swift's wearing a cross, if Miley Cyrus is wearing a cross, I think we've made it into something that's kind of not what it's meant to be. And churches that have crosses that don't actually talk about the cross, Nehushtan, it's just a thing of, or Nehush wood. It's just a thing of wood. It's the power that's behind the cross that matters. And that's, that's why we, we're so thankful for the cross. So this idea of propitiation, it's that Jesus substituted himself. The word propitiation is used in several verses. One of those verses is Romans chapter uh, three, verses 24 and 25. It says this, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means redemption is a financial term. He paid a price. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. There's the fancy word. He set him for it to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his, uh, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay, again, kind of a mouthful, but what's this idea? Uh, he redeemed us. He bought us. He paid our price and has set forth Christ to be a propitiation. The word propitiation carries the basic idea of appeasement or satisfaction. Our, our requirement for salvation was satisfied specifically toward God. Propitiation is, propitiation is a two-part act, reconciling uh, or appeasing the wrath of the offended person and being reconciled back to that person. That's what propitiation is. In this case, it's God, where we need to be reconciled back to God. So these arguments Paul's making in Romans about propitiation is at the very center of the meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, propitiation, uh, it reminds me of words we didn't read in Luke, but in some of the other gospels, we read where Jesus cries out three words. What are the three most amazing words that have ever been declared in the world? Is it, I'll be back <laughs> or in and out <laughs> burger. That's four. Uh, anyway, um, no, the greatest three words that have ever been declared in humanity, I believe, is it is finished. What was finished? The propitiation, the, 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 the satisfaction. The, the, you know, to satisfy God because of our horrible, reckless, immoral, sinful life, the, the sins that we've done, there's, there's a righteous God that needs to be satisfied. And so God sends his only begotten son, Jesus, to be the propitiation, the satisfaction, the appeasement. By the way, um, the Greek word for this word, um, uh, these three words, it is finished that we're talking about. The Greek word for that is, is the word te telestai. You say, well, la ti da. Well, no, it's just one word, three uh, symbols, syllables, but um, te telestai, the reason that's interesting is um, translated to it is finished is te telestai, it's, it's used in Greek literature in the first century um, in four main contexts. And it's really an interesting study. The word, not even just in the Bible, but in all of Greek writing, ancient Greek writing, um, te telestai was used by four different groups. First, when a merchant would complete a business transaction, when it was all done, they would, they would say te telestai, it is finished, paid in full, done deal. Uh, we might say, uh, you know, we're all good, we're square. Uh, you paid your price, I got the goods, or whatever the whole thing is, uh, we're good. Business is done. That's the, that's the first one. Number two use, uh, the, the, the word te telestai, would be when a servant would complete a task for his master. You know, if the master said, go dig a ditch, you dig a ditch, and when you're done, man, I'm done, te telestai. The third use in Greek ancient language when the word te telestai was used was when a, and the Jews were familiar with this one, when a priest in the temple would finish the sacrificial process, uh, you know, sacrificing the lamb or the bull or the goats or the birds or whatever they were sacrificing, when it was all done, which was quite a job, by the way, it was a bloody hard work job when you read the Old Testament, what they had to do. But when it was all done, they'd say, te telestai. And then the fourth place uh, issue where they use the word in the Greek language, in Greek literature, is when an artist would finish his painting, final brush stroke and say, te telestai, or the final chisel in a sculpture. <clears throat> and it was done and he'd say, te telestai. Those were the four contexts. And I, I find that interesting because um, we see that word so perfectly when Jesus is hanging on the cross. 
So as a merchant, he paid our debt in full, the debt that he did not owe, but he paid it for us. It is finished, paid in full. <clears throat> as a servant who is obeying and fulfilling the master, Jesus said, I always do the will of the Father. And Jesus obeyed the master, even in the garden when he was saying, oh Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And apparently it was the will of God, the father, to make sure the son would go to the cross and die. And as he was hanging on the cross, he held out just before he died, te telestai, the servant who obeyed his master, if you would. As an artist, Jesus completed the beautiful picture of what the Bible would show from the Old Testament all the way through the New of salvation uh, the, and, and start a work in our lives. And he would say, the cross is the artwork that is done now. When Jesus died, it is finished. Te telestai. I love that Jesus, it's, it's a past tense that Jesus did it. The evangelist Alexander Wooten, a few generations ago, was approached by a desperate young man who was troubled. He said, oh, what do I need to do to be saved from my sins? And the evangelist Wooten, he said, it's too late. And the young guy sobbed all the more and he said, oh, it's too late. What, please, there's gotta be something. And Wooten said, nope, it's too late. You can do nothing to save yourself from your sins. But he said, the reason it's too late is because Jesus beat you to it. Jesus died on the cross for your sins with the debt being paid in full. You can't do anything to save yourself. Jesus already did it. I love that. He satisfied God's justice. The holy, righteous God had a demand and he had to be satisfied. Uh, and God was satisfied when his son, in whom he was well pleased, died on the cross for the sins of the world. That brings us to the point number two. The cross was necessary to satisfy God, but the cross was also necessary to save sinners. Um, you know, it's not just that God was satisfied, but God satisfied, and because of that, we get to go to heaven, and when you get to the gates of heaven, the Lord will say to those who believe, those who look and live like the serpent, they'd look up. Isn't it something that, you know, a person could have been bit by one of those little red snakes and saw their friends being saved by looking at the serpent. But what about the guys like, you guys are wacko. What a conspiracy theory. You guys are superstitious to believe some brass serpent Moses made is gonna somehow save you. And you could sit there wallowing and foaming at the mouth as you're dealing with the venom of the serpent and dying. Um, but all you gotta do is look. But if you say, I am not gonna fall for such nonsense, what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna die in the dirt of the desert. All you gotta do is look and live. In the same way, the cross is the same. When you're a sinner and you're wallowing in your sin, which we all are, um, even the best of us, the Bible says, oh, there's no one righteous. Even our best works are like filthy rags, the Bible says. And there we are wallowing in our sin. But those who've looked and lived, I bet you most of the people in this room have looked to the cross for salvation. And when they did it, it's not that we're in heaven now, but you sense that burden of sin lifted off your shoulders. You know the forgiveness of God and your life may not be rosy or perfect, but you know you're saved by God's grace. And you're just standing there going, come on, just look. Look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. But there's still some who say, I'm not gonna do that. And they're gonna die in their sins and not just death, but eternal death and hell, the Bible says. All you gotta do is look to the cross and live. So the cross was necessary to save sinners. The word saved is a very biblical word, thoroughly Bible concept. Uh, we must be saved, you know, declared the apostle Peter to men who thought they knew better. He said, we must be saved. Jesus told Nicodemus, you gotta be saved and born again. The trembling jailer, the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself. And, he, and, uh, and Paul says, don't kill yourself. And, and the jailer says, what do I need to do to be saved? And there, Paul explained the gospel and he got saved and later went and got baptized, him and his whole family and started the Philippian church. Saved from what? Death and hell. Humanity is a plight of death. We're in danger of drowning in our sin. And the Lord throws us the lifeline of the cross to, to save us from our sins. The Lord told Nicodemus, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Hebrews 9, 27, the last verse I'll share with you, 27, 28. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, well, that's scary. But the beautiful part is verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That's why God sent his son to die on the cross. That's why it was necessary that sinners might be saved. And apart from Jesus, there's no saving from sins. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, the mockers said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. And I'm gonna say that was true. He cannot save himself because he would not save himself. Had he saved himself, we would have all been doomed. So Christ willingly, intentionally died on the cross for the sins of the world. In just a minute, I'm gonna have a little time where we're gonna end the service with communion, the Lord's Supper. What a, what a perfect way to end a discussion on the cross is to do what Jesus said. You remember the cross by the table of the Lord, the bread and the, the, the cup. Would you please bow your head, heads with me, please? And, and let's prepare our hearts. But while you're preparing your heart for the table of the Lord, can I just ask if you're one who's not looked, if you've not looked to Christ, you're saved by grace through faith. If you've not looked, um, then you, you need to, to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change that. I gotta look and live. How do you do this? This is what you do. You pray the prayer of Romans 10, chapter 10, verse nine and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, Brett, it's not that easy. You gotta be a good person. Nope, you're never good enough. The Bible makes that clear. Jesus was the only one good enough. You're saved by grace. If that's you and you've never accepted Christ, I'd like to ask you this question. Um, would you do that? Would you look? Most of the people in this room, I bet we've looked and lived and we'd all say, look, please. I don't know how to more lovingly and more persuasively try to encourage you, but put down your stubborn you know, ness and say, I don't know if I believe in Jesus. Um, and can I just say, uh, you, you only have yet to just accept and believe the work of the cross. If that's you, just right now, pray between you and the Lord and say this, Lord, I'm a sinner and I repent of my sins. That just means changing your mind about your sins. I repent of my sins and I accept you as my savior. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. If you just whisper that prayer between you and God right now, it says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But Brett, some of people might say, aren't you just giving AC Creekers a license to go off and sin? Of course not. Sin is bad. Sin messes you up. That's why Paul, when he was talking about all this grace stuff, he said, should we just continue sinning then and let grace abound? What did Paul say? God forbid. No, sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. You could go after church and say, I'm gonna go do meth. Um, you can do that, but it's not good for you. In a few, a few months, your teeth will fall out and your hair will fall out. And it's, it's bad, it's bad for you. That's what sin is. God knows what's good for you and bad for you because he made you. But it's not you being perfect that saves you. Um, it's just the grace of God that saves you. Accept that right now. And Lord, I pray that you would just work that in the hearts of some of these people who perhaps maybe have never accepted the grace, the good news. Lord, I pray that they would accept and believe and receive even right now. For those of us that have been saved for a long time, Lord, we take this cup and this bread with great anticipation. Lord, how thankful we are for the, the, the bread that we hold, the body that's a, a symbol, a reminder of Jesus. Um, Lord, I thank you for this beautiful symbol. Even though you never required us to have the symbol of the cross in the church, you did require us to have the symbol of your body through the bread and your blood through the cup. For that reason, we wanna be obedient today. And just as a celebration of what the cross brings, we just wanna remember what you've done for us. And all who are thirsty, and all who are weak, just come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, 
we sing, come Lord Jesus, come, come Lord Jesus, come. I pray that we would, Lord, have more of you in our lives as we eat this bread, this little piece of matzah, Lord, it reminds us the brown marks where it was cooked by the flame. It reminds us of the wrath that was meant for us, but by the propitiation of your son, the satisfaction, he took the heat for us. We're thankful for that, Lord. And we eat this bread, the the little holes in this matzo bread reminds us of the nails in your hands and the nails in your feet, the, the spear that was thrust in your side. Lord, how thankful we are. So we eat this bread with thanksgiving, remembering your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, let's all eat of Christ together. The cup that we hold, Lord, is a reminder, even as Isaiah the prophet, chapter one, verse 18 said, Though our sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be white as wool. So Lord, this morning we're thankful for the cup. I pray you'd forgive us of our sins personally. Forgive us of our sins corporately. As a church, we are failed, miserable people who make mistakes, but forgive our sins nationally, Lord. We're a nation that's full of sin and I pray you forgive us and that you'd wash us, cleanse us, Lord, as we drink this cup, would you forgive us and that we could walk away knowing that our sins are forgiven, just celebrating the power of the cross. So we drink deeply now of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, let's drink together. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and my salvation. I call to the Lord who is worthy And I am saved, I am saved. Let's all stand together. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my Saved by the cross. Lord, how thankful we are for the beauty, the power, the wonder of the cross. Um, May we never forget it, Lord. Bless these, your people. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name.